Did you know about the woman in the window of the rescuers? In the 1977 Disney movie, for two frames, you can see her. Not a cartoon woman, an actual photo of an actual woman who is actually... Yeah. But why is she here? And what does this say about a long history about myths of sneaky, saucy secrets hidden in plain sight? When The Rescuers was released on VHS in January 1999, it had to be recalled three days later because someone had found the hidden woman. This VHS is actually a re-release from a 1992 version, but there wasn't a woman in that version, meaning that the 99 version worked off a different print of the film. Disney assured this version wasn't playing in the cinemas, but I found this clip from Dateline in 1988 about a behind-the-scenes look at The Rescuers, and it does have the woman on TV! So what if the woman in the window has been hiding this entire time and no one has noticed her for 20 years? In fairness, it's only for two frames in the whole film, so it's very blink and you miss it. So it's understandable in a cinema screen, you might not notice. But on a VHS when you can pause and rewind, now that will expose the truth. Albeit through judder and static. Hey, any port in a storm? Any version you now see post-1999 will have the background edited to remove the woman, including on the Disney Plus version. But she was there. So, what happened here? Why is the woman in the window here in this Disney film, and who put her there? It presumably wasn't an animator since this is a background element. It could have been done by someone in the post-production phase, aka compositing, where you take all the individual elements, like animation and backgrounds, and put them all together. There would have also have been an editor reviewing the tape, making tweaks to timing and sound mixing. Then there's screen tests, dailies, final reviews, those whose job it was to spot the mistakes or errors in the animation. The woman in the window could have been done by anyone. So... Let's first focus on the why. <laughs> Maybe it was just a joke. Maybe the intention was to hide something in the scene and wait for somebody in the team to spot it, like a game of what's wrong with this picture. Not intending to go public, but it just slipped through. This isn't unprecedented. For example, there's a rumoured story in the 1950s to 60s where the studio team screened an early sequence of a film to Walt Disney himself. Disney was reportedly extremely good at spotting animation errors, so the team hid a single frame of a naked woman to see if he would notice it. And he did. What happens next is widely debated. Either he found the idea jolly funny and everyone had a big old laugh about it, or he turned around and fired everyone on the spot. This is often retold that this was a birthday film made for Walt Disney instead, or it wasn't a naked girl, but it was Mickey Mouse or Walt Disney doing the dirty deed. Everyone being fired is a popular theory which hinges on the well-known stereotype that Walt Disney was a tyrannical boss and a massive prude. Which would be weird because 1940s Fantasia includes topless horse ladies, and you might think, oh, they're just horse ladies, they don't need to cover their tops, but they wear bras, so they must be topless. <laughs> <laughs> and in the 1946 film Make My Music, it features some, albeit very mild, female nudity. So, given that Walt Disney produced both of these movies, clearly he didn't mind boobies all that much. Except the boobies did get censored in later releases, so uh, maybe. I think we have all heard some version of this story of Walt Disney and the hidden naked woman. Writer Charlie Shows recounts the story firsthand. He asked, what the hell is a picture of a naked woman doing in the middle of a Mickey Mouse cartoon? Since nobody could think of a more inventive answer, we just told Walt the truth. That we wanted to see if he could really spot a mistake on a single frame of running film. Walt looked pleased. He had succeeded in catching a mistake and he was proud of his keen eye. So instead of firing us all, Walt laughed off the incident by remarking, If that gal had any clothes on, I wouldn't have paid any attention to her. This would seem to confirm the story really happened, but Charlie Shows has something of a reputation for embellishment. Disney historian Jim Corkis said, while Shows has many significant accomplishments as a writer for a variety of studios over the decades, his tendency to overstate his contribution to many projects diminished the validity of all of his claims. It appears that Charlie Shows has a known history of claiming credit for things he didn't do and involvement in things that never happened. And that's a shame because he was still a good writer. In fairness, in those days, writers get in any credit for their work at all was such a struggle, so maybe he felt like he had to overcompensate to get any recognition. So this brings into question, did the naked woman story actually happen? It should be noted 
that no one else in this infamous screening, no other animator, not even Walt Disney himself, has ever shared the story themselves. And for such a noteworthy anecdote, you'd think someone would have mentioned it. But the only recorded account of this screening actually happening is Charlie's shows. So if there's any element of this story that's actually true, we may never know. My gut says probably not, but then my gut says a lot of things. Kill them! I should probably get that looked into. Whatever the case may be, given he died in 1966, Walt Disney's eagle eye wasn't around to spot the woman in the window. Or should I say, albatross eye. So maybe instead of a joke, it was actually meant to be a secret. Hey, did you hear? In Roger Rabbit, when Benny the Cab crashes, if you pause it at the right moment and look carefully, you can spot the secret joke that somebody put in. Jessica Rabbit is not wearing any underwear. Like the rescuers, this is another instance of it only being spotted on the VHS tapes, but also on Laserdisc. Whatever happened to the Laserdisc, Laserdisc? The problem is, even with the most high quality footage at the time, it's still not clear if there's anything to see. The skirt definitely wafts open and it does appear to show something, but it's impossible to see what it is. So was this upskirt really a secret joke? It's possible that whatever's there is just a colouring mistake in the painting stage. Maybe it was meant to be a shadow or part of her skirt or whatever, but it was just painted the wrong colour. Given there were 55 minutes worth of animated shots, each at 24 hand-drawn frames of animation in the movie, mistakes will happen. Like, what's up with this brick? You see that? It's just kind of floating there. I feel like a weasel should be holding that brick. I can't not see the brick now. Look, I'm sorry if I've ruined this for you, but look at this brick! Basically, if this was sneaked in as a secret joke, it's not a very good one. It's way too subtle. In Fight Club, there's a scene about sneaking adult material into movies using projectors. Basically, film reels would sometimes come in separate parts, and there's a mark in the film telling the projectionist to time up the next reel as seamlessly as possible. In the industry, we call them cigarette burns. With control of the movie handed to the projectionist, it just takes someone a little experienced with photo developing and editing to slip in something to go completely unnoticed, other than as a private joke. Obviously, in The Rescuer's case, this is something baked into the movie itself. The same is true for The Exorcist and The Ring. Unless whoever edited this particular version of the VHS added it in themselves, like Tyler Durden. But it goes to show that people love hiding subliminal stuff, especially if they don't belong in these films. Proof of projectionists actually doing this is scarce, other than in anecdotal stories, since the point of it was to not be noticed. But I did find one story that's definitely not subtle at all. In 1921, a projectionist was fired from one of Berlin's top premiere cinemas. So during a regular film screening, he changed the reel to a pornographic movie, locked the door to the projection room, and then left the cinema. How did the audience react? A journalist present reported the following. Describing the impression the new film made on the decent and tidy part of the audience is not possible. For this new film was an accumulation of the most horrific pornographic scenes imaginable, such as one could hardly believe that any human being would lower himself to record. The audience was gripped by an incredible excitement. The orchestra immediately stopped playing. <laughs> I forgot there was an orchestra there. It's a silent movie. <laughs> Shouts sounded that the show had to stop. Hysterical screams echoed from the box. The outraged crowd crowded towards the exits. However, many ladies remained seated and thus provoked indignant protests from the decent part of the audience through their shameless behavior. That is some badass girl boss right there. They were probably like, hang on, I want to see where this goes. So yeah, not subtle at all, but it does lead into the disgruntled employee narrative. This comes up a lot in these kinds of urban myths. Someone was about to be fired, so they got their preemptive revenge by hiding something somewhere undetected. For example, on the home video VHS cover for The Little Mermaid, the crowd surround this golden castle and one of the spires is clearly a big old penis. And then the story around it became disgruntled Disney artist about to be laid off, hit the willy in plain view in an act of spite. We'd love for that to be true, but no, they weren't about to be fired. The artist in question was hired for a lot of the merchandise for The Little Mermaid and had little time to complete this particular image. And so they rushed the background detail late into the night and... Uh-oh. I guess you could call it sloppiness. 
<laughs> God, that was terrible. There's a claim that because the disgruntled artist was made to work so late, they actually did put it in there on purpose and tried to backtrack it, but it was too late. I actually contacted Disney animator Dave Woodman, who worked on The Little Mermaid, and he confirmed this whole thing was a lie. All this confusion is enough to make someone disgruntled! And there's this scene during the wedding where the priest has an erection. Aha! Disgruntled employee was about to be fired, so they... No, it's just his knee. Dave Woodman confirmed it's just his knee. Tom Sito, the Disney animator who actually animated the bishop, said it's just his knee. Occam's razor strikes again, but Disney did remove it anyway, just in case. Was the woman in the window a result of a disgruntled employee? Wouldn't an actual disgruntled employee just quit? So what else could it be? In The Lion King, when Simba lays on the cliff, the dust spells the word sex. It doesn't. It's supposed to spell S-F-X, as in a reference to special effects. Disney have also removed it, just in case. This, however, now leads to the conspiracy theory that Disney are actually purposely trying to warp the minds of children. The Lion King had a talking picture book. You know, the kind with the buttons that make different noises. And if you press on Rafiki, he would say... What he's actually saying is... But because it loops, it kind of runs together, kind of like a squashed banana up your ass. I feel like if my son squashed a banana up his ass because a talking monkey told him to, I've probably done something wrong as a parent. And speaking of parents... In Aladdin, the group claims that in this scene, a voice can be heard saying... Good teenagers take off your clothes. This got a lot of parents upset. In 1995, one mother referred to this film as a toddler introduction to porn. Actually, a toddler's introduction to porn is blippy and is video. Don't look it up. Anyway, because Aladdin is trying to keep his voice down, he's whispered and garbled. It's, it's hard to tell what he's actually saying. The second half is obviously take off and go. But the first half is unclear. The script says good kitty. A Disney spokesman said it was good tiger. It doesn't sound like either to me. Does he actually say good teenagers or are we just hearing what we're told to hear? Like the supposed satanic messages when playing certain songs backwards. In this instance, the good teenagers line could just be the result of bad sound mixing. Listen again and imagine that you might be hearing two lines mixed together. One good teenagers take off the We can speculate on what happened, but Disney decided to remove this ambiguity and edit the scene on any current version you see today. He now says, and then the rest of the line fades out. The bad faith argument that Disney is trying to brainwash or indoctrinate children with this sort of stuff is funny to look back on as all being dumb and silly and in the past, but it's still happening right now. A Florida teacher was under investigation for showing Strange World, a Disney movie, to her class. The mere presence of an openly gay character fell under the Don't Say Gay Bill. Remember when I made that video about the absurdity of moral panics and how it's weaponized by politicians seeking power? Anyway, the fact is, this is a result of a bygone error. As movies are made digitally, it's harder to sneak stuff in without anyone noticing be it an elaborate in-joke, disgruntled employee, or secret attempt at brainwashing children. So, sorry, there's no sex act hidden in a drawing in Boo's room. But less chance doesn't mean zero chance. In 2017, in an episode of the kids' show Maya the Bee, people spotted on the side of a tree log a very clear image of a cock and balls. Netflix pulled the episode and the situation was resolved. So you might be wondering, if Netflix pulled the episode, how did I get this video? because the animation studio put it back on YouTube in 2019, crudely drawn cock included. And I respect it. So we've explored all the ways people can hide stuff into films, but what about the rescuers? Before we can figure out the why, it's time to figure out the who. Who put the woman in the window? I was ready to conclude that it would be impossible to know who put the woman in the window. It occurred at some point between the 70s and the 90s, and when it was discovered, no one was going to suddenly own up to it. This has been an unsolved mystery for over 45 years. Until now. While I was talking to Dave Woodman about The Little Mermaid, I saw a post on his Instagram that mentions the rescuers. And in the description, there's a name. 
Annie Gunther. Anne Gunther was a background artist who worked on Robin Hood, Winnie the Pooh, and, you guessed it, The Rescuers. But what did she have to do with the woman in the window? Anne Gunther died in January 2017, and in a memorial post on Facebook, among her extensive credits, she painted the background with the notorious Playboy centerfold in The Rescuers. This post was made by Tom Sito, who you may recall drew the bishop from The Little Mermaid with the knobbly knees. So I contacted Tom Sito and asked, was Annie Gunther responsible for the woman in the window? His answer, yes. Annie told me herself. Annie Gunther, born in 1937, starting out as an uncredited inker on Sleeping Beauty, she became Disney's second ever female background artist in the 70s. She became such a well-respected artist, she would be asked to train new artists. But when the position of head of the background department opened up... John Bluth called me in his office and he says, Annie, I know you should take over the background department. You trained this guy, you know backgrounds, but they won't give it to a girl. So they promoted the person she had trained and then fired her. The last Disney movie she ever worked on was The Rescuers. So maybe there's an element of the disgruntled employee narrative that's actually true, that Annie Gunther was upset to not be considered for promotion because the industry was such a boys club, so she planted the woman in the window to get back at the execs before being laid off. Take this job and shove it! I suggested this to Tom Sito, who told me, that's a nice theory, but not true. It was just an in-joke. Animators have been putting things like this in cartoons since the 1930s. Disney claimed that The Woman in the Window was not in the original cinema release, only in the 1999 home video release after using the wrong copy of the film. But even though there was a clean version for home release available, hence the 1992 VHS, it appears she actually was in the original 1977 cinema release, and this wasn't a mistake. Nobody in 1977 thought 45 years in the future, people would be studying these cartoons frame by frame with advanced computers. Okay, in here's that shot. I should note, it seemed like it wasn't actually her idea that someone else may have goaded her to say, go on, it'll be funny. No one will ever know! Not anticipating that technology would get to the stage where such a hidden secret detail could be spotted or become the subject of a video essay. Uh, whoops. Annie was beloved in the animation industry, but despite being on the animation board for the Oscars for over a decade, she was not mentioned in the 2018 Oscars memoriam. So, I'll do it. After Disney, she spent the rest of her career working for Hanna-Barbera, Filmation and Warner Brothers. She worked on Space Jam, The Iron Giant, The Turtle, She-Ra, He-Man, Fern Gully, Animaniacs and won an Emmy for her work on Tiny Toons. Annie Gunther, groundbreaking Disney artist, Emmy Award winner, Animation Academy member, board member of the Animation Guild, part of childhoods across many generations, and the woman who put the woman in the window. There's one final question remaining about all this, and that is, who is the woman in the window? Does she even know she's been in a Disney movie this whole time? There's speculation that this could have been revenge porn, that she's the partner or an ex of a Disney employee who in petty retaliation snuck her photo in so he can have the last laugh. But given that Annie Gunther was married with a husband, it's pretty unlikely in this case. So presumably, she's a model that Annie found and cut out of a magazine, specifically Playboy. While we could look at every issue during the film's production from around 1970 up until its release in 1977, animation studios were a boys club, so they would have had issues just lying around. This could have come from any issue way back to his original publication in December 1953. So, we checked them all. That's right, every issue, every centerfold. We searched every photo of every page of over 270 issues. We searched so thoroughly, I had to apologize to my mum and she washed my eyes out with soap. It's what I deserve. And in conclusion, she's not there. Despite the commonly held belief, the woman in the window is not in Playboy. We check Hustler and Penthouse 2, although not every issue is available because, oh my fucking god! The problem is, in the 1970s alone, there were a lot of these kind of magazines, and with international animators and artists, they could bring along international issues too, and because of such limited availability, many of these are potentially lost to time. 
Given the odd framing of the photo, the woman is probably not the focus of the photo. It's probably like an ensemble, like a wide shot of a party. She appears to be stepping out of a gold tinsel curtain, perhaps onto a stage like a strip club or a burlesque show. But unless the original photo can be found, we can only guess. So the mystery carries on. There's a lot more haystacks on top of this needle, but who knows? The advancements in technology from the 70s to the 90s surprised everyone by allowing anyone to have the ability to discover these hidden butts, boobies and willies in the movies. So maybe today's technology will advance in such a way that we can finally discover where this photo really came from. But until then, Annie Gunther's in-joke has the last laugh. Ha! If you want to know more about the movie industry and its shaky relationship with sex, I've been really enjoying Unrated, a series presented by Maggie Mae Fish that explores how sex is portrayed from the silent era to the modern erotica. But risque is risky on YouTube with the threat of demonetization, so this series is only available on Nebula, who are also the sponsors of this video. Nebula is my video streaming platform that is creator-made and creator-owned, so by signing up, it directly supports some of the best content creators out there, and also me. And it's ad-free. As well as supporting creators, you also get access to exclusive original and bonus videos, and also Nebula Classes, a masterclass of video production and analysis, all as part of one subscription. All my video essays are on Nebula. In fact, this very video was available a week early on Nebula first, so you can get more content even sooner while supporting myself and other creators at the same time. It's like a copy of Playboy, except the ads are removed, the articles are read out to you, and the only thing stripped off is 40% off an annual subscription when you use the link in the description. Also, throughout September, there is a special offer for a lifetime membership you should definitely consider especially if you plan on living for a long time. So what's your gut reaction? I know mine. Kill them. Would you shut up? No. I sure wish we'd have taken the train. Special shout out to my patrons, including Trey Brock, Sloan Schoolcraft, Rusty Robot, Jay Slynn, Vinny Vex, Drifter Star, Beamer Tectonic, Moel Kasemi, Setsune Wave, Eustace Jack, Glenn Sugden, Blaze Launcher NG, Ben Burns, Pappy the OP, Louis Wilde, Aaron is Chummy, Joe Wood, Nathan Chowie Nati, Matthew Smith, Brett Halford, Alex Weston, Clam Wamsley, Joel Jennings, and Lyra Fay. And if you would like to support me, then please consider doing so on Patreon. 